In this video, Jordan Peterson explains how we react to our environment in different situations. So, okay. So, basically what you do to train an animal to be afraid is you take a rat, let's say, and the rat's in his cage, and you, you, put, you put a little electric shock pad in the rat's cage, so it maybe electrifies the bottom a little bit, and you turn on a light, and you electrify the bottom, and the rat jumps into the air, and then you shut it off, and then you wait a while, and then you do the same thing. Turn on the light, then you turn on the, the elect electric shock mechanism, and the rat jumps in the air, and you do that ten times, and then when you turn on the light, the rat goes like this. Freezes. Because it's learned, right? Light equals shock. Everyone knows that. You know, that's basic conditioning. Um, so the rats learn to be afraid. Okay, that makes sense. Except... Here's your experimental box, right? You got the electrification going on in there. And you grab your rat and you drop him in the cage. What does he do first? He freezes. Because he's afraid. He's afraid as soon as you put him in the new environment. That's the normal rat. The normal rat is like this. And why is that? Because things like to eat rats. So, you know, they don't like light. They like it dark. And they don't like being exposed, and they don't like being in a new damn cage, because God only knows what's in that cage. And so the a priori rat is this. So then what does the rat do? Well, it's like this for quite a while. It can be really a long time, I'll tell you a story about that. He's like this, and then maybe he sniffs. Because rats mostly nose, most animals are mostly smell oriented, right? Human beings are weird because we're visually oriented, but almost all animals, it's all smell. Their whole brains are organized around their olfactory system. So it sniffs, and if it can't smell anything, rats, man, they can smell. So there's experiments indicating that if you take a rat and you poison it, and then it gets sick, and another rat has smelled its breath, that rat will not eat the poison that the first rat ate. Now that's why it's hard to get rid of rats. They're smart, and they have great senses of smell. So the rat's checking out, like, is there anything here that smells like something that might eat me? So, cats, for example, a rat doesn't ever have to meet a cat to be afraid of its odor. Rats hate cat odor. And so you can take rats in, a, like, a box and blow a fan over a cat so that the odor wafts into the box, and it's like, the rats are all like this, because God only knows what a cat smells like to a rat, but it ain't good, whatever it is. So, the rat's like this, and then he's sniffing, and he's looking around, and if nothing happens, then he starts to relax a little bit, but not that much. He's still all crouched down, and he's still like a tentative rat, and then he starts to look around a bit, and then he starts to loosen up, and then maybe he starts to move, and his theory is, possibly it's safe enough here so a rat that's careful can move, and nothing painful or damaging will happen. And then he starts to move, and nothing happens, and then... He spends a bunch of time sniffing around every corner of the cage, and, you know, sooner or later he thinks Rats aren't going to die here now, and then he's sort of a relaxed rat And then the behaviorist says, you are now a normal rat We can teach you to be afraid It's like, you don't have to teach me to be afraid I know how to be afraid I have to learn how not to be afraid Now that's a good way of thinking about your brain so you could think about the underlying motivational and emotional systems in your brain as default on systems. They're like a nuclear reactor. Like the core of a nuclear reactor. You're ready, man. Except when other parts of your brain are telling you just to keep it calm. So, but you don't need to learn to be afraid any more than you need to learn to be hungry. You need to learn how to be calm and secure. And that's really worth thinking about. Because you've got to ask yourself, for example, why are you calm and secure in this class? What are the preconditions for you not being afraid here? So think about it, why are you not afraid? Well, the floor is solid That's a good one The roof is probably not going to collapse Why? Well, it's actually because you could rely on the structural engineers who built the building That's kind of interesting Why? You know, in the Soviet Union, they used to make cinder block buildings out of old radioactive waste and then of course they'd put way too much sand in them so that if the earth went like this once it'd be like collapse and so the typical Soviet couldn't be reasonably 
fearless in this room because the walls were radioactive and if the earth moved a little bit the whole thing would collapse and so part of the reason that you can sit in here without fear is because the system that regulates our construction enterprise is actually not very corrupt so that's pretty cool so you know so when you think about that that means that one of the preconditions for your relative fearlessness is your implicit belief that the builders who built this building can be trusted and that's really unlikely you know if you look around the world how many countries are there that aren't corrupt? I mean, you know, the West is corrupt too, there's no doubt about it, but compared to a really corrupt place, you know, we don't even register as corrupt. So what else? Well, look at the people around you, you know. You guys look a lot the same, all things considered. You know, none of you are, have painted your face in rainbow colors, and you know, you're not decorated with ostrich feathers, and you're not wearing some outlandish Victorian costume, and none of you are stark naked, and most of you aren't foaming at the mouth, and you know, <laughs> like fundamentally, you're in a uniform. And there's some variation of the uniform allowed, but not much. How many of you are wearing jeans? Right, it's like 50% of you. Why are you wearing jeans? It's so other primates don't think you're insane. <laughs> That's why. I'm, I'm telling you, it's a big part of it. It's, it's, it's acceptable. And so, most of you are wearing clean jeans, I presume. Or they're clean enough anyway, so that if they're not clean, it's not detectable. Which is another sign that you're not completely insane, right? And so you're manifesting markers like mad that you're basically a normal primate. And that you live in accordance with a set of well-understood implicit rules. And that for the purposes of this set of interactions, you're not going to violate them. So everybody can come in here, like the terrified primates they are, at the first class, and they can look around and they see the desks are all in order. So that means order prevails here. The desks all face this way, so it's a standard lecture theater. You know what's going to happen here. People walk in, they all sit properly in their tables. Most of them don't talk, which is another rule. How many of you are sitting in the same chair that you sat in last week? Right, and you know, pretty soon you're going to figure out which chair is yours, and then if someone comes in here and sits in your chair, you're going to think, that person's in my chair. And you know, the reason for that is, is you're trying to stabilize the environment. You've learned that that chair is safe, and so are the people around you, and so now you feel kind of comfortable in that chair, you sort of think it's your chair. And so, we, we do everything we can to structure the environment, so that signals that you're safe are radiating at you like mad. And that way you can be calm enough, despite the fact that you're a crazy chimpanzee, you can be calm enough to sit here and not be distracted by fundamental motivational systems that are out of control, and maybe listen and attend. And like, you just think about how much work, just think about it, how much work went into building this room for you to sit in. You know, it's like there have been universities for about a thousand years. So there's a thousand year conceptual history of the university, that's one of the preconditions. And then, we had to figure out how to make all this stuff, and then people actually had to put it together, and then you all had to be socialized for like 19 years, so that you could sit here relatively quietly while you're listening to a lecture. And, you know, we had to build the idea of the, the university into our culture, and, you know, somebody's got to keep the lights on, and look at this technology that works. It's like, there are people out there just slaving themselves to death to make sure that this little box that you're sitting in is sufficiently predictable so that you don't have to be terrified it's like good for them you know and it's all happening so invisibly that you know you're probably irritated because your internet connection doesn't work that well or something like that you know so so it's really really useful to know that it's a the idea that your normal state is calm and well regulated is highly debatable it's highly debatable. I would say there's very limited preconditions under which you are going to feel safe. And then I would also say you're highly motivated to maintain those conditions and you're also highly motivated not to go somewhere where those conditions don't apply. Right? You're just not going to do it. Because that's a different kind of place. And I would say that place is chaos. The place where the rules do not apply. That's chaos. And it's a real place. That's unexplored territory. And people, you have, you're hardwired at an instinctual level to deal with unexpected exposure to unexplored territory. 